the most interesting guests in the music industry, entertainment, art, and politics, step into the studio for Turning Point with Frank McKay. Richie Kanata is this week's guest on Turning Point with Frank McKay. Richie Kanata is a music producer with a world-class studio in New York, but many fans know him best as the sax player in the Billy Joel Band, alongside Doug Stegmeyer and Liberty DeVito. Let's listen. And now, Turning Point with Frank McKay. Welcome to Turning Point. Our very special guest today is musician Richie Kanata. Richie, how are you? I'm doing fine. How about you guys? Doing great. You've uh, you, you're having quite a career. For those who don't know, uh, Richie is a wonderful sax player, and I don't know how long you've been playing, but you've played with the likes of Billy Joel, and you still play with Billy and Bernie Williams, and just about you know all others that I can imagine. When did you start playing? Well, I started playing uh, music when I was about four years old. I started at that point, and um, it was piano. And uh, soon after that, I started playing clarinet, which was probably around six or seven. And then around eight, I, uh, I got the tenor saxophone in my hand and never looked back. Tenor sax is your instrument? I would say so. You know, I, I do play alto, soprano, flute, baritone. But tenor is the one that uh, people recognize uh, all my, my main solos with uh, all those artists that I've played with over the years. Do you remember your first time on stage? Um, I kind of remember my first time on stage. It was probably in um, the Battle of the Bands, you know, um, and I was probably about about 10 years old, you know, and uh, we had a little band in, in our elementary school, middle school, and uh, we went on stage and played, and then we played uh, When the Saints Go Marching In, and it was kind of fun. Yeah, well, for you, that was a, you were probably the lead instrument there, right? Right, I really was, yep. How about your first time in the studio? First time in the studio, uh, I probably was uh, a little bit older than that. I'd say probably around 12. Um, and uh, I remember recording a record to Acetate. And what's Acetate? Acetate's a, like a, a big, uh, like a disc, like an album. But it was thick back in those days. You know, it was just, uh, you know, straight recording to an Acetate. They were kind of like um, test pressings of albums. Where was that? That was in Huntington, Long Island. Oh, Crest Records? It might have been Crest Records, yes. How about that? Mac Wolfson, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It might have been. How's that for a memory? Wow, that's good. Yeah. You grew up on Long Island, New York. I was. I was born in Brooklyn, and the Garden City South is where I, my parents moved from Brooklyn to Garden City South, and then uh, I moved from there after I graduated high school from to uh, Brooklyn to Manhattan to Queens to Connecticut and back to Long Island, and uh, now I live in... Uh, I, the North Shore of Long Island. What were you like in high school? Um, high school was a mixed bag of uh, sports and music. Uh, I was very much involved with uh, all the music programs, you know, being uh, president of the band and, you know, leader of the jazz club and uh, in the orchestra and choir. And also I was captain of the football team and captain of the wrestling team. Who did you like as a sax player? Who really stood out to you? Well, back back in those days, you know, of course, everybody listened to Charlie Parker and John Coltrane. I liked Paul Desmond, who was the saxophonist with uh, Dave Brubeck. I Take liked five. him. Um, Gene Ammons, I liked. Uh, and then as I got older, I became friends. He was older than I, but Michael Brecker. And uh, I loved his playing, and I listened to him. And then another colleague of mine, but older, was uh, David Sanborn. So those those two guys, you know, were my contemporaries. When you get out of high school, what, where do you go from there? Do you, do you go to college? Well, my dad, my dad said to me, don't go to music school because I was doing pretty good music-wise. He said, go to a school that will be close by to where you want to gig and do stuff and, and uh, you know, where the cultural center is, which is New York, and get a business degree, a marketing degree. Get something that uh, you, know, you could uh, parlay whatever monies you're going to make into uh, a good lifestyle. So I went to the University of Bridgeport and got a degree in marketing research and economics. Any and while I was there, I, I participated in all the music programs as well. Well, you've done pretty well on the, the business end. If, uh, for those who don't know, you own Cove City Sound, which is a world-class, absolute world-class studio here right in the suburbs of New York City and uh, on Long Island, and it's, uh, you've done wonderful with it. Cove City Sound Studios has been here 26 years, and we've got uh, Grammys and Oscars out of here. We've done 
uh, music for movies, uh, Chicago and Dream Girls, and uh, and we've had uh, the last big record we did here was uh, Dream Theater's record, and also J Lo did her last record here on the floor, which has been shown to be a huge, huge success in the pop field. And so we're you know we cross over to everything, and we're pretty happy about it. How much of your success in Cove City do you apply to your training in in business school, if any? Uh, a lot. A lot, you know. Here, here, it, uh, it crosses both over musically and also business-wise. You know, you have to pamper to those who are or musical and uh, be able to do the accounts payable. Make sure that the studio collects what it's deserving and and keep the gear uh, running properly and and paying your staff and and investing in the right things to to make a good living for yourself. On that note, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be back with Richie Canada. Thanks, guys. We are back with sax player and sax player extraordinaire, I think people would say, Richie Cannata. Richie, you come out of college, and I imagine you did, you did well with your, your studies. You seem like a, a studious guy. Uh-huh. Uh, were you a partier or were you a student? Well, you know, I'd be a liar to say that I was in college and I didn't drink a beer, you know. Uh, I, I think uh, that's the time that you do your experimenting, and back in those days we did do that, and we we did party to an extent. But uh, I'm above ground, you know. I'm alive, and and um, you know that was one part of an adolescent, you know, uh, uh, that I, I think is unavoidable. But um, you know, I survived it. You know, I you know I I now am not doing any of that partying. The partying that I do is making music and playing and going on the road and, and being a studio owner. That's that's a big party for me. And it's a high enough, I imagine. Oh, yeah. If you can't get off on playing at Madison Square Garden 12 nights in a row, which was our last tour with Billy, I mean, then there's something wrong, you know? Oh, that's just amazing. I mean, just saying that people's, <laughs> people walk on stage when there's no crowd there just as a, as a cleanup crew, and they'll stand on Madison Square Garden, and they'll say they'll get chills that they'll never forget. Imagine being paid to perform on Madison Square Garden stage. To be recognized also, uh, you know, for that achievement where it's never been done before. And there was a, a HBO did a special on uh, the 50 greatest moments of Madison Square Garden, and I was chosen uh, to be one of the 50 great moments playing New York State of Mind uh, during one of those shows. And it was quite a, you know, it was quite an honor to be part of that and Madison Square Garden when you live you know I live in New York and was brought up in New York that venue to us you know was the, the greatest stage on, on the planet and then to play there and then uh, you know I played there many times before but the last run we did 12 nights in a row and, uh, and I have to tip my hat to Billy because uh, you know his great music and and uh, was something that brought those people to come see us play was the 12 the number 12 playing that many performances was it a specific number to beat a former record or was it just random you know something um, i think billy and management had a had a strong idea to go out and break the record and i don't know what the record was i think the record was eight or nine shows in a row maybe ten times who? who was the record holder i, I think i'm gonna guess i'm gonna guess you want to guess and I, we'll guess together uh i i Wow, I don't even know who that would be. I Think about it. Uh, not Sinatra. No, Springsteen. Springsteen, right. Right? I would think, I, I thought Springsteen had a nice run there, but I'm not sure. Wow. I'm really not. I mean, that's you know? an amazing run. I, I mean, eight. Eight nights at Madison Square Garden. And it's then we went ahead and did 12. 12. We could have probably done 15. <laughs> just unbelievable. You know, it was just one of those runs. Everybody... Uh, wanted to see us there, and it was a great show. And it was my reunion with Billy, too. I had rejoined the band then. So uh, it was kind of fun because him and I were the only two original band members that did it. Were you in in the band when they played Moscow? No, I wasn't. I was out on the road with the Beach Boys at that time. I was a strong Beach Boy band member with Carl Wilson. How are those guys to deal with? Um, they uh, are very interesting to deal with. I mean, they're 
they have been rock stars since they've been 16, 17 years old, and that's their lifestyle, and they're wonderful. I get to work more now with Al Jardine, one of the remaining. There's uh, basically three Beach Boy remaining band members, which are Brian Wilson, Mike Love. Mike Love, and Al Jardine. And the whole Beach Boy band, after Carl passed away, went with Al Jardine. And we've been uh, playing with him, and it's been, it's been great. It's great music. You, you just can't deny that. And you know, Check us out. We're always out doing something, and uh, it's, it's amazing. It really is. Did you get to know Brian? Yes, I did. I got to play on Brian's record uh, with him. Um, he is, um, uh, to at, at, at least the expression is uh, savant. Sometimes he's yeah. brilliant, you know, and then other times, uh, you know, he's he's um, you know needs to be told to you know just where to walk and where to go. Um, he's he has in the studio showed me signs of his brilliance as he did with Pet Sounds and those great records. And uh, there were other times where you know he's just wasn't sure where his whereabouts were, you know, but he's he's an amazing, amazing person and a musician that, uh, as you know, even Paul McCartney and the rest of the Beatles gave much uh, credit to. Yeah, uh, Pet Sounds uh, had some influence on Sgt. Pepper's, which really uh, certainly gets the, uh, the, uh, the bulk of the, uh, of the attention from that era. Right. What, were you a big Beatles fan? I, who wasn't, you know? Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, you... you Again, there's no denying how great they were for the short time they were around, you know. And their music speaks for itself. And their, their whole whatever they were, you know, you know, you can't even call it marketing. You just call them these the fabulous, you know, four guys from Liverpool that took control over the planet. And they started adding horns after a while, right? So you, you got some horns in there. Uh, with with uh, the Beatles? Beatles. Um yeah, I think uh, they they did, uh, and I think McCartney was probably responsible for that because he kind of liked some of that, especially with his solo career. But I think the horns were mainly, you know, um, uh, George Martin and and the Beatles combination overdubbing. You know, I, yeah. I'm only guessing. I can't believe I'm talking and, and analyzing the Beatles. <laughs> none, none of us reserve any right to do that. But, uh, you know, if I were to guess again, you know, I would think, you know, um, when I'm 64, there was a clarinet part on it that I thought was brilliant, you know. Who knows who was responsible for that? We'd have to ask Paul yeah. at this point, you know. Turning Point with Frank McKay returns right after this. Welcome back to Turning Point with Frank McKay. We are back with Richie Canada. Hey, Richie. guys. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm just saying, hey, this has been awesome. Richie, you, you're a little bit producer, right? A little bit engineer, a uh, big part of it is, is uh, mu musical. Uh, how much of your attention goes into production? Um, I, I think it's it's um, it's almost a self-conscious, uh, uh, subconscious situation. Production is a is a fine line of what it actually is. I mean, when uh, there's a client then at the studio, whether or not I'm I'm in on a session, I'm always producing in my head and thinking, well, this could go there, that could be taken out that should be louder softer that's production you know on the music side and production is again a fine line where there are many steps before you even push any record buttons and after you're done pushing every record button you know there's a there's a long list of things that need to be done when you talk about producing a record and i am definitely involved in it since to, you know from the beginning to the end so i'm always producing i listen to tv and i hear a commercial you know and i'm in my mind saying I, I would have produced it differently or I would have done that it's it's always something that's a subconscious thing that I that I have how closely related is producing a record as compared to directing a movie wow um, since I've never directed a movie <laughs> oh, you can imagine right what goes it into could, it it could be I mean it, wow um, probably Probably the movie's got to be, you know, because you're dealing with locations and you're dealing with, with major stars and and uh, from you know from weather to uh, you know wherever uh, wherever we're going to be on that planet, it has to be ten times harder. You know, producing a record, we're in we're in a controlled environment. We're in the studio. You know, the band is here, the artist is here, 
it's basically done here. You know, I mean, you know, rarely you go out and do an overdub somewhere else, but think about it. You know, we That's have a, a we have a controlled environment right here in our in our re- recording facility. Uh, a movie, they go, let's go to Budapest. You know, we right. want those mountains. Okay, so <laughs> think about that. Think about getting gear and people and passports and food, and it's crazy. Yeah. You know, that's all part of production. Well, that's interesting. That's an interesting take. Uh, what about you as a producer? Are you heavy-handed? Are you kind of let let the music flow, or does it differ depending on the artist? Um, it's a good question. Um, I'm definitely hands-on because I know music. You know, there are great producers that don't know music but have have big uh, books of uh, of uh, of references. Um, I can read music. I can play music. Uh, I can tell you what I think should happen. I could I could example it by by actually performing it for you. Um, so I'm hands on. But if I feel feel that the band or the artist is you know on a run where they're doing it, I'm not going to stop them and say, oh, do it my way. You know. Yeah. It's certainly you know it's certainly something that they should be creating. Uh, and that's what music's all about, you know, not about, you know, getting part of uh, the engineering and doing pro tools and, you know, auto-tuning, beat detective, shifting, you know, pitching. It, no, that's not music. That's, you know, that's technology making music or making it a form of entertainment. You know, when, when an artist is singing and they're on, they're, they're doing great, let them do it. You know, all the Billy records, no no time signature, no time uh, uh, metronomes, there was no beat detective there was no auto tuning we just went in there and played music what i heard concept? so ramon say once that with billy joel if he i think maybe this is early on in his career but that if he got a track in one take he would just never believe that it it, it could be good enough and he would insist on doing it again and what phil ramon said and uh, is that he would he learned to just keep the track because sometimes he'd come back and he'd, and he'd say, you know, that first one was the best. And he'd say, well, here we go, we have it. Well, uh, mo- most often it is that. Most often musicians think that they can do it better. Uh, you know, it's just different. It's really not that much better. All the solos that I did for Billy were all one-take solos that were the first time through. Most of my stuff is that. Maybe you, did, you may be right solo. We worked on it a little bit longer for some reason. But uh, all the rest of the stuff was really just one take, you know, two takes. Maybe a third if that I can't re- even remember, but we always went back for me. And Billy, too. Billy liked to sing and play at the same time, which was great. Who was the first producer you worked with? First major one yep. was Phil. I mean, how much more major could that be? You know, Phil Ramon came to us. We were a bunch of guys in our 20s, and he came to see us play at Carnegie Hall and said, I want to, you know, um, I'd love to produce this band. And he kept the band. You know, he could have went to his, uh, you know, uh, stock of great studio musicians, but he kept uh, myself, Liberty, yeah, DeVito, Doug Stegmeyer, and uh, um, I guess Russell Javers was there at the time too, maybe Howie Emerson, and uh, we all went into the studio and started doing Turnstiles. Oh, excuse me, that's not right. We we did uh, the Stranger record. Turnstiles was already done. So, Tell me so. a little about Phil Ramone. What, what's it like working with a guy like that? Uh, it's the it's the the best. You know, his uh, his application to get us to play is and how he applies himself and his musical abilities are amazing. He could just walk into the room and I want to play better. I don't. He didn't say a word yet, but I want to play better. That's Phil Ramone. You know, uh, he had a way to tell us what he wanted. He was a fifth band member. He, uh, you know, he made himself. He he joined us. He was very. He, he was. He just jumped right in. He knew how to do what the. Uh, uh, what he needed to do to get the music out of us. We needed that. We needed to be told by someone else that the bass was too busy or the drums were not busy enough or the saxophone should be here, you know. He was just that type of guy. Tell me about the beginning. When did you first meet Billy? I met Billy. um, uh, They were recording the basic tracks for the Turnstiles record, and I had done a recording session uh, as an overdub uh, that Doug Stegmeyer and Liberty DeVito were on, and uh, Doug's brother, Al Stegmeyer, was the engineer, and I came in the following day, and he said, boy, my brother just joined this band, uh, this guy, Billy Joel. And I knew Billy as the piano man. He said, they're looking for a sax player that plays keyboards. And I said, I do that. So he hooked me up with Doug, his brother. They came to see me play. They liked what I was doing. And then they invited me to Ultrasound Studios, Ultrasonic Studios in Hempstead. 
and they were cutting. I went in there and I said, "Where am I going? Where am I going to fit? I'm a saxophone player. This guy's, you know, Mr. Piano Man, you know." So I walked in and they were recording uh, "Angry Young Man." I don't know if you know that song. Of course, who doesn't know that song? And I said, "Geez," I said, "These guys are hot." Then he said to me, "I'd like you to play on this one," and he played me "New York State of Mind," the basic track. And I wow. said, "Okay, I think I can do that." And uh, we went out to Colorado to the Caribou Ranch, and the, the first uh, song I played on for him was New York State of Mind. And I met Billy that night at Ultrasonic Studios in Hempstead, 16-track studio. If you had to describe Billy Joel's talent, and he's a genius, obviously. He's a brilliant songwriter. H how do you best describe him? What makes him so brilliant? I, I think his brilliance is that he bridges his brilliance to the layperson and writes about it. Um, he could he could write a story and sing a story about Vietnam, uh, about Allentown, Pennsylvania, about New York, um, uh, about an Italian restaurant. He's brilliant. And he bridges it with music and lyrics. And then he leaves those holes open for myself it was mainly, you know, more saxophone than anything else with the records that I played on to fill in the holes. And it worked for me, and it worked for him. And thusly, look how many records we sold, and we're still talking about it today, aren't we? No question about it. Does he, does he attack a song in its writing by improv, usually, or does he develop an idea? What's his method? Um, you know, I don't know if there's a blueprint for him. Um, I think whatever method works is the time that he's doing it. He might... You know, he sat at an, uh, at an Italian restaurant and, and a waitress said bottle of red or bottle of white to him, and off he went. Amazing. You know? So, Rest I mean, he didn't, go, he didn't go into a room and say, let me write a song about uh, a scene from an Italian restaurant. Let me, you know, I think, you know, I, he needs to be inspired by something. You know, I, I, I think to get the correct answer, you've got to ask Billy about that, and I think he would, he would give you, uh, you know... I don't think there's I don't think there's a method. He goes, okay, I'm going into my room on Tuesday and I'm going to write a hit song. I think when it happens for him, it does. How about you? Same. When whenever I feel the vibe, you know, um, I, I can't say that Wednesday's going to happen for me. I could say I'm going to try, but it's just when that moment strikes, you know. And if it's flowing, you just keep going. When we come back, more with the very talented. Very, very talented, Richie Kanata. Turning Point with Frank McKay returns right after this. Welcome back to Turning Point with Frank McKay. We are back with sax player and all types of other things, Renaissance man, Richie Kanata. Richie, we talked quite a bit about Billy Joel and and certainly the methodology behind uh, you know some of this musicianship you've worked with some of the some of the real great musicians and you mentioned the band Dream Theater and as far as New Yorkers go and Long Islanders go Dream Theater is as close as you can get to Rush or something and it, and and it's they're different they're their own they're their own band and their own style but what can you tell us about Dream Theater wow um there's so many adjectives, and probably the, one of the greatest musicians that were ever here at our studio. Uh, they, um, you know, the expression, do the, the talk and then do the walk. They do both. They, they, they'll say that this is what they're going to do. They show up and do it, uh, and then some. Um, they're probably our most prized possession on Long Island as far as musicianship. Um, John Petrucci is an amazing amazing guitar player and writer um they all are there's they're, they're just they, they all are there's nobody in that band that's that's slacking and you would you would think that you know, because they're all so so good and uh, with their new drummer mike mangini uh this year they even took it to another level and they got nominated for a grammy uh from a song that they did here at my studio so we were really you know pushing for them to to win that they're an amazing band they just are just great musicianship there, and it must be nice to be able to work with them like that. How are they? You mentioned John. What about him? What is he like in the studio? Um, he is he's uh, very together. Number one, he knows what he wants. He's very particular in uh, 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 making sure that he knows all the parts. He knows what he wants on drums. He knows 
what he wants on bass and keyboards and, of course, guitar. He, he's got an idea in his head. Uh, he, what I could see from his working uh, this as a producer, uh, he was very, very um, capable of making this great record. You know, there wasn't like, well, let's default to a band member to produce this record. No, it was like a step up that he produced this record. And he was, you know, he produced it with the band. And uh, uh, it was something that he had no problem with. He's very, 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 very good at what he was doing. Extremely cerebral. I mean, he's, and, and a nice Italian guy from New York, you know. Right. Who wanted to get the ashes on, you know, Ash Wednesday and palms on Palm Sunday and go to church on Easter Sunday, you know, that type of guy. He's a wonderful guy. You may be the perfect person to ask about the transition between analog and digital, and, you know, certainly Pro Tools has has really taken over. Uh, watching that, watching the development of the recording studio, what, what's your take on it? I mean, you, are you happy with the direction of recording? Or are you not? Well, um happy you know i'm happy if my business is doing well you know we had a struggle through the adats and the da88s and you know we went to digital format um analog recording is still the best sounding way digital is the probably quickest and you have a you know bigger set of hands and tools to fix things and to edit things unfortunately it takes a not so good musician and makes them into a better one which is that is that fair you know uh, am I happy? Sure, because I have more clients thinking that they could sound good, and we can make them sound good, you know, through shifting pitch, uh, through shifting, you know, kick drums, to to making, um, uh, you know, beats to uh, cutting and pasting, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, we still do analog recording here. It's still the best way that we do it. Um, do you still uh, have an 8068? We have an 8068 Neve console. Amazing boy. So you could track on an 8068 Neve uh, to analog to the Studers. Uh, we have three Studer machines, and then listen back on a on an SSL. Did you ever get the opportunity to meet Rupert Neve? Oh no! But wouldn't that be awesome? Yeah, that would have been awesome, right? I was. I happened to be in a studio once, and someone had a, a module from a Neve console, and he ran down. It was an engineer, and he ran down the hall, and he almost fell down the stairs trying to trying to get to someone, and he had learned that Rupert Neve was in the building, and he just wanted him to sign it. He just <laughs> wanted him to sign it. It was like, you know, meeting Joe DiMaggio or... or uh, yeah, sign my baseball back forward and sign my 8068 Neve console, please. <laughs> it's such a beautiful board, and I've been in your studio, uh, you know, a while back, and you have such a great drum room, and it's just, it's it's a unique yeah, the, studio. the drum room is really, really big. It's a 40 by 40 room with a, you know, 25, 30 foot ceiling. Um, and we track, like I said, on the Neve. It's it's no better than that. It's just, it's great. Everything we track, everything to the Neve, the Neve Pre's, and the EQs. It's just amazing. I was going to say that engineer ran down the hallway as if he was going to get an autograph from Bernie Williams. Ah uh -huh. <laughs> Someone else you've worked closely with. Yes, Bernie. I'm his musical director. Uh, and uh, those of you who don't know who Bernie Williams are, is he's an amazing baseball player for the New York Yankees and brought them a bunch of World Series rings, and now he's um, a musician, always has been a musician, a guitar player, and he plays uh, uh, Latin jazz, and and uh, he had a, a record that was, that this last record that was out was uh, on the top of the charts for a long time, and I put a great band together for him, and we've been out here working, and it's been fantastic. Yeah, he's really a wonderful guitar player. I mean, I I saw he, him and Paul O'Neill in some, some kind of commercial uh, doing you know some kind of yes promo or something that like that and and you know it wasn't too impressive but when you hear that album <laughs> he did a hell of a job yeah i got to play on those records too and he's he's amazing it really really is and we have some gigs coming up this year uh starting in the summertime here so we're excited about being out there you should check us out wherever you see bernie williams name and uh, it's a, uh the all-star band is fantastic as well but what is that like someone coming from baseball and and coming into a transition like that, and I'm sure you had a lot to do with the the transition and, and melding into the music world. Well, it's, it's funny. Uh, here's here's a gig you're gonna love. I, I played the Star Spangled Banner at Yankee Stadium, and that's where I met Bernie. And uh, we hooked up there. And for me, I went just to play the Star Spangled Banner and be in awe of all the Yankees. And here, 
Bernie was going, wow, that's Richie Canada who plays the saxophone. I said, no, this, this is not right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I'm just a saxophone player. He goes, I'm just a baseball player, you know. But we hooked up, and, and we made a transition, and he, and he has a book out that he talks about it, which is fantastic. But um, we sometimes I look across the stage, and I've got um, uh, my son is in the band. He's the lead singer. I got my my closest friend Julio Fernandez from Spira Gyra in the band that I know for 25 years. I look across the stage. I see Bernie, Julio, my son. I go, what is this? This is like, yeah, you know, am I living the? I am living the dream, you know. So, it's been a great transition for Bernie and and for us. And he's very open-minded about his music, and we all have a great time doing it. Are you a Yankee fan? Big time. Yeah, same here. Big time. No question. And. Uh, you know, I think Yankee fans in general are cheering on uh, Bernie every uh, every step of the way. Right. We're going to take another quick break, and we're going to be back with Richie Canada. Great. And we're back with Richie Canada. Richie, what was the turning point in your career? Wow, it's a great question, and it's uh, very pertinent to this whole interview. I would say um, there were many turning points. You know, uh, I, it could be the turning point when my dad bought me my first saxophone. You know, um, uh, the turning point of uh, the first gig I got, um, or maybe my first big record with Phil Ramone. And I'd have to, I have to say, if, you know, I can't talk about career when I'm 10 years old or I'm, or, or I'm seven and my dad bought me a saxophone because I didn't know, nor did he. But probably for my career, the turn, turning point was when we met Phil Ramone and we decided to do this music that we've been playing out on the road that he wanted to record. And the first record was the Stranger record. So uh, that did turn me around as a saxophone player and be, made me... Uh, oh, uh, people were then aware of my playing. So I have to say the turning point for me was when I was with Billy and Doug and Liberty and myself and Phil Ramone joined the, the picture and uh, he produced this great record for us. You know, you've mentioned a lot of big names and Phil Ramone and, and certainly playing with, uh, with Billy before he was, you know, the huge Billy. Is there anybody you've met or that you've worked with over the course of the years, where you really were taken aback when you met them, either by their persona or by their talent. Is there anybody that stands out to you where you just said, my God, this is this guy? Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, uh, Have you met a Beatle? Uh, yeah, but it, um, uh, it was... I've never been... <laughs> the weird part about it, the musician... Part of me never. If I would have met Frank Sinatra, I would have done that, right? Mm. Um, but the musician part, I, I you know, but the the guys from Dream Theater, yes, a little bit. You know, Bernie, I was in awe of, over because he was this great baseball player, and I watched him from my living room yank home runs lefty and righty out of the stadium for a bunch of years, and that was a big awe for me. But musicianship wise, I, I got to think about. Um, uh, there's there's been. You know, I'll tell you one uh, was Stan Getz. Right. Oh, gosh. okay. It's a good one. Uh, we went to uh, we went to Cuba with Billy, and uh, there was a music exchange, and the CBS Jazz All Stars went, and and Stan Getz was in the CBS Jazz All Stars, and I met him on the private plane, and I was in awe over him, and I couldn't believe that he actually knew who I was, <laughs> and that was wrong. You know, because he, it, our records were out, and you know, and and I got to spend a week in Cuba with Stan Getz, and Weather Report was on that. Then Jaco Pastorius was there, and of course, all those guys are great. But for me, Stan Getz was probably the guy, because yeah. my dad had also turned me on to Stan Getz records when I was a kid. So he was one of the greatest saxophone players, and there I was on a private plane, in an inc really controlled, you know, situation, and going to Cuba, and me and Stan Getz sat together on a plane and talked saxophone. I mean. Yeah, I was pretty impressed. Did you meet Castro? Did not, but he was at our shows. And uh, we played at the Karl Marx Theater, and uh, it would be an, an American band and then a Cuban band. And it was pretty awesome. 
Wow, that's Karl Marx Theater. Yep. Yeah. What, where do you go from here? Well, where do I go from here? Um, I have a new record that uh, I just made. It's wonderful. Only the record. Way. What's that? It's wonderful. Yeah. It, here's the funny part about it. There's a, a metaphor and expression that is, a shoemaker never has shoes for his kids. Well, I have had my recording studio for 26 years and never did a record. So this last past couple of months, I made a record, and I used all my great great friends and uh, that I play with at uh, Joel Rosenblatt on drums, Julio Fernandez on guitar, Gene Perez on bass, Chris Clark on keyboards, uh, Don Harris from Tower of Power on, on trumpet, um, uh, Chris Palmero and also on keyboards. Um, who did I miss? Uh, uh, it was, it's been, I think I got everybody. And it's now number 18 on the Billboard charts. It's amazing. Uh, smooth, smooth jazz. And we are performing around and look for look for my band on my website, and you'll find out where we're playing and what we're doing. And it's like I didn't follow any thread. I didn't listen to smooth jazz records. I played everything on my tenor, and most smooth jazz records are all on alto saxophone. And I did everything on tenor except for one track. I did soprano, and uh, we didn't follow any niche. And we are now. Uh, leading the the uh, you know the, the the system here a little bit. People are listening to what I'm doing. What are you going to do to support it? Are, uh, you plan a tour? Or? Yeah, we're, we're doing something right now. We're supporting a tour. We're going out and uh, we're doing gigs. Um, we are, um, which is a hard thing because it's very expensive to bring your band out, and it's not like a Billy Joel gig where you go and show up and there's 25,000 people. You hope that you know you hope that you get 250 people. You know. Yeah. Um, and it's not like you can hire guys along the way that can play like these guys. I know, and I'm being forced to do that. Uh, uh, this fall, I'm, I'm asked to go to Japan, but to use a different band, you know. Um, Who's the label? Know, uh, Brown Dog Records, oh. independent label here on Long Island. Oh, that's uh, very exciting. I, I can't believe this is your first album. First album. Uh, it's kind of crazy, but that's this is what the story of my life. You know, I'm always catering to everybody else and making sure everybody's happy. And forget about myself. And I said, this year, let me just do it. Richie, you're having a great career. It's a great album. Congratulations on the success. Thank you so much. And again, the website? RichieCanada.com. Uh, and you'll find me on Facebook. I uh, do some navigation. And you'll f find me with CoveCitySoundStudios.com. I'm everywhere. You can't miss me. You could run, but you can't hide these days. Well, you're absolutely right there. <laughs> and this has been an honor. Richie Canada, the great Richie Canada. And thank you for joining us, Richie. God bless you, bro. Thank you. Same here. And okay. Thank you guys for listening. We'll be back next week on Turning Point. Let me just take that last part again. We are with the wonderful Richie Canada, and we've been honored to have you, Richie. Thanks for being here. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. And thank you for listening. We'll see you next week. Turning Point with Frank McKay was produced by Out of the Box Studios in Bohemia, New York. Executive producers, Frank McKay, Harry Oates, and Bart Pellegrino. Director of Operations, Corey Arnold. Segment producer and talent coordinator, Kristen McKay. Audio and studio engineers, Francis Kazmarek and Tom Shazam. Studio support, Mark Harwood, Pete Galgano, Brian Hunt, Danielle Altabrando, Keith Withers, and Chris Luna. Sound mixing and mastering, Daniel Joseph. Hotel accommodations provided by Ohika Castle, Hotel and Estate in Huntington, New York. Transportation services provided by Mark of Elegance Limousine in Hopong, New York. Catering services provided by Windows on the Lake in Ronkonkoma, New York.